here. Hi. I feel like this is like our, like our church family because I know all of you and um, Chris loves all of you so much and you two do such a great job of taking care of her when we're six hours away and I know she loves you so much and we are so honored to be able to be here with you and share what God's doing at Reliance Center. We're so honored to have the partnership that we do with you to continue to be able to do what we do because of you. So I want to share with you, do I have a clicker? Oh, okay. You have it on a timer? Okay. <laughs> I like having a clicker. I don't like not being in control. All right. Next slide, please. So I, I think all of you are familiar with who we are and what we do. Is that right? If you're not familiar, raise your hand. Okay, cool. Then I don't have to explain all of it. But September 11th, we, septem we celebrated our second year of being open, this past September 11th. And in 2020, we provided 1,161 services. We served 834 clients. We saved six babies from abortion. And 103 people committed to making a change in their sexual choices. Now... What I think is interesting about those numbers is that those are the numbers until October 1st. So from January until October 1st, those are the numbers. And I wanted to tell you that, you know, I know over here in Washington, everything kind of shut down. And so I, part of Idaho shut down too. But what didn't stop was teens having unprotected sex. What didn't stop was marriages from being destroyed. What didn't stop was girls thinking that they have no worth and value. What didn't stop was women thinking they needed to choose abortion instead of life. And so our numbers at the center, from the day that we opened until, I'm trying to find the right page. From the day that we opened until December 31st of 2019, we had 450 appointments. From January 1st of 2020 until October 1st of 2020, we had 834 appointments. So that's almost double the appointments only to October, right? So you can't tell me that people aren't desperate for hope. You can't tell me that people aren't desperate for truth because those numbers tell it, right? Those numbers show you that people were desperate for hope and for truth. We performed, sorry, I had these all in order. I think Rick messed them up. <laughs> That's always my go-to. Uh, we, in the pr previous year, we had 822 services that we performed, and this year so far, we've had 1,161 services that we performed. So that shows you that it, our numbers are going up. Our impact is going up. And we impacted, if you go to the next slide, we impacted almost 7,000 people this past year. And so what that is is we do what's called impact math. So if we say that we had a girl come in for an STD test and say that girl currently has five sexual partners because that's not uncommon these days. So if that girl has five sexual partners and each of those people have five sexual partners, we do the math, right? So we figure that with one person, we could be impacting hundreds of people with just speaking truth and, and helping one person. When I go in and speak to a classroom and I speak to 35 kids, you know that each of them is going to impact their sphere of influence, right? If I teach a class and I help one family learn how to parent their children with love and logic instead of destructive behaviors that they've been using before, and that child is in a kindergarten class with 20 other people, and that child's behavior gets better, that impacts his whole class, right? So that's where we come up with that number. I didn't serve 6,900 people, but we impacted 6,900 people. And that math is, is, is pretty solid when you think about what impact math is. Um, I never thought that when God told me 
gave me the vision of Reliance Center that we would be doing what we're doing. I never imagined that we would have the impact that we're having. I never imagined that I would have the stories to tell you that I do today about the people that we're helping and the type of help that we've offered. Um, we have made progress on our mobile unit. Next slide, please. So this is the mock-up of what our mobile unit will look like. Isn't it pretty? I wanted it to be hot pink, but they would not let me. <laughs> um, so we have raised, so far, $98,000 towards the cost of the mobile unit, and we have 100000 left to raise. If you go to the next slide. The cost of our unit when we went to sign our contract was roughly 160000 but because of taxes and tariffs and everything that's going on in the world, the price has gone up, um, almost 30, well, $38,000. Um, but we're confident that God is going to continue to, to provide what we need. And it is my hope that maybe next year when we come, we can drive that baby up here so that you can see it. Um, but I am excited about that. I'm so excited about moving towards that because just similar to your area here, you know, there's Seattle and then there's a million little tiny towns. Rick's from around here, so my mom is asking him, what town are we in? What town are we in? Because they're all different. You know, this is, is this, what town is the church in? Oh, I heard two different things. Stanwood. So the church is in Stanwood. And so Chris lives in Arlington or Smoky Point? Is that a town? Right. See, so there's like a hundred. All right. So just in your area, there's all the little towns where where we live, our center is based in Lewiston, but we have 30 small rural communities around us. And what happens is, is that say a girl is in high school and school gets out at 3.30 and we close at 5 and say she has cheerleading practice or something like that, or her mom can't pick her up and bring her into town. So she can't get to us before we close. And we stay late Lots of times we stay late. I know I need to set better boundaries, but we stay late half an hour, an hour sometimes, but sometimes people just can't get to us. And so I don't know about you, but in the Bible, Jesus went to where the people were, right? Jesus went to where they were and met them where they were at. And so that's why this mobile unit is so important is so that we can continue to take the gospel, continue to take the high quality free medical care to these little rural communities and help these women that are so desperately wanting hope. Because the numbers I just showed you show that people, more and more people are needing this hope that we offer. So we're so excited about that. Next slide. So this is one of the stories that I wanted to tell you about tonight. And I so much enjoyed, um, is it Rada? Um, I loved his presentation, and one of the things I remembered about last year when he spoke was, I remember turning to Rick and said, there's tigers where they live? Like, tigers just walk around? And he was like, yes. It's like, in, he's by the, they're by the jungle. So whenever I see him, I think, that's the guy that lives where the tigers live, <laughs> because that just, you know, I can't fathom that. But I enjoyed what he was talking about, about how we can't be afraid, and we can't be afraid of what is coming, right? My, my thing on the whole coronavirus is, is if I get sick, God's going to be with me. If I die, I'm going to be with him, right? Like, I'm not afraid. Bring it. You know, like, I'm not afraid. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to do what I need to do to protect other people, to protect myself. But I'm not afraid, right? But the world tells us that we need to be afraid. The world tells us that we can't do things. The world tells us that we're not capable. And the world tells us that we need to be afraid. We live in a culture of fear. And that is, that's what our culture is dominated by right now, is fear, right? Oh my gosh, who's going to be president? Oh my gosh, there's people dying from coronavirus. Oh my gosh, there's floods. Oh my gosh, there's earthquakes. There's still Jesus, though, right? Like, is there still Jesus? Yes. So why are we afraid of what's happening, right? The Bible tells us not to be afraid more times in the Bible than it tells us anything else, right? It tells us not to be afraid 365 times in the Word of God. How many days are there in a year? Right? So why are we afraid? This girl was 14 years old when she came to see us, and she found out she was pregnant, and she was ready to have an abortion. And she came to us because she wanted to find out how far along she was so she knew what kind of a procedure to have. 14 years old. Now... I, did, I wasn't even sexually active when I was 14, and I can't imagine having my 14-year-old come to me and tell me that she was pregnant. I can't imagine. She walked into the center, and she said, I have to have an abortion because I rodeo. She's like a rodeo star, so good at rodeo. And she said, everyone's telling me that if I get pregnant, I can't rodeo anymore. 
Now, can you ride a horse when you're pregnant? Yes. After you have the baby, can you ride a horse? Yes, right? So she's believing this lie that the world tells her that she can't do it. She can't have her dreams and her baby, right? You got to choose one or the other. You can't have your dreams and your baby because you got to choose. So I got to be the one to tell her that that was a lie. I got to be the one to tell her that she could continue to rodeo. She could continue to ride a horse until her doctor told her that she couldn't. (laughs) And after she had the baby, she could put that baby on a horse. How beautiful would that be, right? So this brave 14-year-old, I mean, I would venture to say little girl, (laughs) chose life for her baby. And you see that picture of her holding that ultrasound? She was elated to be a mom. Can you imagine being elated to be a mom at 14 years old? I can't. But she was elated to be a mom. She carried her little girl, and she named her Delia. I think that's the the cutest name ever, Delia. She was like, I wanted to name her Dahlia, but she said, my grandpa said that he hated the smell of Dahlia, so we named her Delia. (laughs) And that is her and her boyfriend, Cole, who is also, they're both 15 now, but That's their little baby, and she just did her first barrel race, and she won. She put her baby on the horse for the first time, and she said when she set her daughter up on that horse, she giggled like she'd never giggled before. Now tell me that that's not redemption and that that's not God giving her a good job, right? Like God giving her a little atta girl, you know, good job, well done, thank you for choosing life. And her boyfriend, Cole, Um, I don't remember if I shared with you last year when we were here, but last year we got the chance to go to Washington, D.C. and take one of our clients. Did I share about that at all? Maybe? No? No one remembers? Um, Last year we took one of our clients to Washington, D.C., and she got to meet with legislators from Idaho and talk to them about the importance of centers like Reliance and how Idaho needs to keep the same abortion restrictions that we have and not go off the bandwagon and make abortion legal up until 24 weeks like it is in Washington. Um, and we had a most incredible time. It was called Babies Go to Congress, and our client got picked to go with her son. Well, this brave girl, um, Harpy International, who sponsors that program, contacted me and asked me for her story. And I think that this year we get to take this brave girl to Washington, D.C., and she's going to advocate for Washington. And we're going to talk to Washington legislators and, t- legislators and tell them about how Washington needs to get its act together and not make abortion legal up to 24 weeks and show them this sweet baby and have them hold this sweet baby as a visible, touchable reminder of how precious life is. So Cole and Zeta, her name is Zeta, and Delia were in my office. This was just taken last week. And I was asking them, can you tell me about Reliance Center, about what Reliance Center has meant to you and the impact that we've made in your life? And Cole said, this 15-year-old kid, right, we just think teenage boys are kind of dumb and stupid and, you know, just like, okay, whatever, you know. But this 15-year-old kid said to me, Heather, you saved Zeta's life. You saved my daughter's life. And he said, and you made me see that everything I've been believing about babies and abortion my whole life is wrong. He said, I've been taught, I'm like fired up, I'm knocking everything off. He said, I've been taught my whole life that it was just a clump of cells. And he said, if you wouldn't have showed us that ultrasound and you wouldn't have showed us our baby on that screen, they would have just taken, taken my daughter out of her. That's what he said. They would have taken my daughter out of her. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, thank you. He's 15 and he knows the value of life. And he was able to look at me and say, thank you. That's powerful. That's powerful. And that's God. That's, that's God showing them the value of life. Right? I, I really hope that, um, that they choose her story. And um, if they do, I'll make sure and send you guys updates and pictures and stuff. But how powerful would that be for her to sit in front of those senators and congressmen and be able to show them her baby and say, you know, If it wasn't for places like Reliance, my daughter would not be here. That's powerful. Okay, next slide. One of the things that we do at the center is we do STD testing. And there are a lot of people that think, well, why do you have to do STD testing? What does that have to do with pregnancy? What does that have to do with unplanned pregnancy? What does that have to do with abortion? Well, when young people are making destructive or toxic decisions with their bodies, 
it's our job to tell them the truth about who they are and the truth about their bodies and the truth about the decisions that they're making. Because sometimes knowing the truth about who they are helps them make decisions that are smarter and wiser. And, you know, we have, we serve men and women. So we have men come to us that are living homosexual lifestyles. We have women come to us that are engaged in the hook, hookup culture. They meet a different guy on Tinder every night and have, you know, seven different sexual contact contacts within a week um, and then do it all over the next week. I mean, they're engaging in hugely destructive behavior with their body. And while we talk to them about waiting until marriage and we talk to them about protecting their bodies and knowing who they are and knowing that they're valuable, I had a girl come in the other day and she was in college and she had come in for the second time to get an STD test. And the first time she came in, I talked to her, you know, and I gave her the, I always say the same thing put my clipboard down, I ask them if I can touch them. They usually say yes. I put my hands on their shoulders and I look at them straight in the face and I say to the women, and I say, you know that you are beautiful, right? And they like always look down, always look down at their lap. You know that you are valuable, right? They always look down, they won't look at me. And I say, I said, look at me, will you look at me please? And they look up, you are valuable. You are worth something. Do you believe that? 90% of the time they tell me no. No, I don't. Do you know that you don't, be ha you don't have to be having sex with these guys because, because that's what you're supposed to do? Do you know that that is a gift and that is something that you can hold on to? This girl came in and she came in for the second time and so I was like, you're here for the second time. Like I told you I didn't want to see you back here because I tell him that. And thank you for coming in, but don't come back, right? Because we don't, we don't have a sign on our door that says, thank you, come again, right? We have a sign on our door that says, thank you, don't come back, right? Because we want to be transformational. We don't want it to be a spinning, revolving door. We want them to be transformed by what's happening inside, transformed by the gospel, transformed by Jesus, right? So when she, she was sitting in front of me again, I said, why are you back? And she said, well, you know, I had unprotected sex, and I'm worried, you know, I'm having STDs, so... At the end of our conversation, I went to go through my intake, and I always say at the very end, is there anything else you feel like you want to talk about? And she goes, well, I guess I'll take the opportunity while I'm here. And I was thinking she was going to, like, have some huge revelation, and I was like, I don't know if I have time for this or I'm ready for this. Like, I was like, okay, you know, what is it? And she said, well, I just met this guy, and I really like him, and I think we're going to wait a week to have sex. And I said, okay, you know, so... I want to preface what I'm about to say with, please be sure that we talk to our clients about abstinence and we talk to them about, about waiting for a marriage. But this is a girl who, who has had multiple partners, and if I had just said, just wait till you have sex till you're married, she would have looked at me like I had snakes coming out of my head, right? So I just wanted to preface what I'm about to say. So she said, I think we're going to wait a week to have sex. And I said, okay. I said, why a week? And she said, well, I just want to see if he's, you know, if, if he's worth it. And I said, okay. I said, what if you waited a month? She looked at me. She looked at me like I had snakes coming down my head then. She said, a month? I said, yeah, wait a month. Wait a month to have sex with him. I said, don't snuggle with him in bed. Don't, don't put yourself in situations where you might, you know, it might happen. Go to movies. Go take walks. I said, let him hug you and hold you and rub your back. I said, see if he pursues you. See if he makes you feel cherished. And she was like, looked at me. She goes, yeah. And I said, I said, yeah. I said, see if he makes you feel valuable. And she goes, yeah. And I just thought in my head, yeah. You know, like see if he makes you. And so she left and I said, I want to know. I said, I want to know. I mean, let me know what happens. And I said, I guarantee you that you will feel more powerful and more empowered by that choice than you will by choosing to sleep with him after a week or after two days or whatever. And I reminded her that intimacy has nothing to do with sex. Sex is, is an act, and, and sex can be intimate and beautiful within the confines of marriage, but sex outside of marriage has nothing to do with intimacy. So if she wants to know what intimacy is with that man, they need to not have sex. And so I told her that. So it had been about a week, and we called her with her results for her test, and as the nurse was talking to her, I was out of the office, but the nurse talked to her, and when I got back in, the nurse came in my office, and she was grinning from ear to ear, and I was like, what? 
And she said, that client from, a, from last week, and I said, yeah, and she goes, she told me to tell you something. And I said, what? And she said, she said she's going to wait a month. And I was like, yes, you know, that is incredible. That is a win. She's going to wait a month, right? And so I guess I th- it, was, it, was a little, it was longer than a month ago because then she called back. And she said, this is what she said. She said, we waited a month, and she said, we still have not had sex. And she said, and I think I want to marry him. This girl had gone from multiple relationships, doing destructive things with her body, destructive things with her body, and because I was able to speak truth to her and remind her of who she was and how valuable she was and how valuable that gift was, she might have found the man that she wants to marry. That's incredible. And that's because God is allowing us to do what we do at Reliance Center. So that's one of the reasons why we do the STD testing that we do and why that service is so powerful because we're reaching these women in circumstances that they would not normally come to us. We have had, what did I say, 103 people check on their form, which is 99% of our clients check on their form that they're either going to wait till marriage to have sex or that they're going to make a change in their sexual decisions. And that is huge. That is huge because I guarantee you that when they go to Planned Parenthood or even when they go to their doctor, their like primary care provider. Have you ever sat down with your primary care provider and had them ask you how your heart was doing? How you were, how, how you were feeling? You know? My, my doctor, who just retired, was amazing, and he was a Christian man, and so we talked about my heart all the time. But most of the time, these young girls go in for their appointments and are in and out so quickly that they don't have those conversations. So I'm thankful that we can do that at Reliance. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. One of my favorite things is when we have a mom comes in and um, we always ask for permission to text and lots of times um, I give them my personal cell phone number, which I probably shouldn't and so you can talk to me about boundaries later, but uh, I text this girl um, whom I was sure was going to choose abortion and you know, I texted her, how are you feeling today about everything? And she responded with, good, a little bit better, better. I plan on keeping the baby. And I'll tell you what, those texts are my favorite texts to get. I jumped up in my office and screamed and yelled and hollered and, like, everyone in my office probably thought, I don't know, something. But they all came running in they're like, what's wrong? And I was like, nothing's wrong. Look, she's, she chose life for her baby. And when she came back in for her ultrasound, I said, you know, what, what changed your mind? And she goes, you did. She goes, you reminded me that I can do it. You reminded me that I'm strong. You reminded me that this baby's not a surprise to God. And while I know that, you know, God, God gives me those words, I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to do that because I, I might not have the opportunity if it wasn't for Reliance Center. So this next slide, I want to walk you through a progression here. Um, this girl came to us, and her boyfriend called to make the appointment. And he called, and uh, he said, you know, I need to make an appointment for my girlfriend, which we don't do. We don't let other people make appointments for anybody. And he said, but I need to make an appointment for my girlfriend. We, uh, we just took a home pregnancy test, and we wanted all our options, and we're considering abortion. And so my receptionist, you know, said, okay, well, she has to call because I can't let you make the appointment. So can you tell me what's going on? And he said, we just don't think we're ready to be parents, and she's so young, and I don't think she's ready to be a mom. So he's talking for her, right? He's, you know, saying she's not ready to be a mom. She's not. So he wanted to make the appointment. So we said, sorry, have her call back. We ended that conversation. She called back in the conversation with her. She said, I just want to know all my options. So she made the appointment, and she came in. And as I'm talking with her, I, we always take the woman in first. He came with her to the appointment, of course, but we always take her in first. So she goes into the bathroom. She leaves her pregnancy test. I know that her test is positive before I step into the room with her, but I don't reveal that to her until later. But So we go through our intake process. And as I'm talking with her, I'm asking her, if I step back from here, can you still hear me? Yes? Okay. As I'm talking with her, I'm asking her things like, why do you think you need to have an abortion? You know, what, what is going on? She just kept saying, well, he just thinks I'm not ready. He thinks I'm too young. And so I put my clipboard down, and I looked at her, and I said, what do you think? What do you want? And she said, I don't want to have an abortion. And I said, well, then why are you even considering abortion? 
And she looked at me and I said, really, why are you letting him tell you what to do with your baby and your body, you know? And she said, well, just because he really cares about me. And I said, how long have you been dating this guy? And she was like, a month. And I was like, okay, well, for sure, you don't need to listen to what he's saying. You need to make the decision on your own. So I told her, you know what? Your pregnancy test is positive. And according to your last menstrual period, your baby has a heartbeat tomorrow. And she looked at me and she said, tomorrow? And I said, yep. And she said, so what does that mean? And I said, it means, it means your baby has a heartbeat tomorrow, you know? I said, what does that mean to you? And she said, that means that my baby has a heartbeat and I don't want to have an abortion. And I said, yeah. I said, isn't that incredible to know that that life inside of you already has a heartbeat? And she was like, it is, that is incredible. So we bring him in and he sits down next to her and I she tells him that her test is positive and then we sit there and I ask him if there's anything he wants to know. And he goes, yeah, he goes, so how far along is she? And I said, well, she's almost six weeks. And I said, your baby has a heartbeat tomorrow. And he goes, a heartbeat? Are you serious? Are you kidding me? The baby has a heartbeat? And I said, yeah. Sorry if I broke something. And I said, yeah, the baby has a heartbeat. Your baby has a heartbeat tomorrow. And he goes, oh, so what, that means we have to have a different procedure? I said, what that means is that, and I said her name, what that means is that she doesn't want to have an abortion. And I said, you know, I know you think she's too young. I know you think she's not done with school and she doesn't have a career. And I said, but you, what you're doing is you're listening to the lies of the world. This is she can't have her dreams and her baby because that's a lie. And I said, what you're doing is tell her, telling her that she can't do it. And she looked at him. You should have seen the way she looked at him. And I said, do you think she can do it? And he goes, well, yeah. And then she goes, I can do it. So those words, your baby has a heartbeat tomorrow, changed everything for her. So I text her later. I, wasn't, I was, still wasn't sure what they were going to do. We got her in for ultrasound. She got to see her baby on the screen. She got to see the heartbeat, hear the heartbeat. Text her, and I said, um, how are you doing? You know, how are things going? Um, you're really brave and really strong, and uh, I hope we'll stay in touch. And her response was, hi, I'm doing okay. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's normal to be sick this early, but I've been super nauseous and puking. But we told my mom, we're telling my dad tonight, and then we're telling his parents next week. Telling my mom went super well, and she was super supportive. And I said, oh, girl, I'm so happy for you. How, to feel, how do you feel about your decision? And she said, I'm feeling okay about it, just definitely still scared, stressed, terrified. But I think it will subside after we tell our parents. And then I said, did you open the little box that we gave you? It's called a love box. And in it is a little onesie that says best gift ever. I said, did you open the box that we gave you? And she said, we did. I'm so thankful we came to you guys. I would not be where I am without your support. I can't wait for the day we get to put that baby in the onesie. And then the other day, I just texted one more time to check in with her. And she said, things are going well, officially out of the first trimester. My morning sickness is gone. We also found out we're having a little boy. I count my lucky stars every day we came to you guys, and I hope you know how thankful we are for your support. So if she would have listened to the world, and she would have let him drive her to Planned Parenthood, we found out we're having a little boy. That text message would read something like, you know, I don't know if I can have kids again, or... I can't believe I aborted my baby. But it, instead it says, found out we're having a little boy, and I count my lucky stars every day that I came to you. That's powerful. And that's a visible reminder of God's goodness and why we need to trust him and listen to him and not the world. Right? Um, oh, sorry. So today, Rick and I um, had the opportunity. How many of you know who Abby Johnson is? Are you familiar with, can you raise your hand if you know who Abby Johnson is? So Abby Johnson is a woman that used to be the director of a Planned Parenthood in Texas. And she was, she got Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year, and she worked for Planned Parenthood forever, until one day she was asked to participate in an ultrasound-guided abortion. And 
I feel like I can speak freely here. There's no kids in here, right? But I feel like I can speak freely because yesterday, Radha showed us pictures of, um, you know, depictions of, of dead bodies and bones and things like that. So I'm going to be kind of graphic with you, but um, it, it's in the same context that Radha did um, about the death and destruction of our culture. Is that okay with you? Okay. So um, Abby it, it participated in an ultrasound-guided abortion, and what that is, is is when the abortionist uses an ultrasound machine to see what he's doing inside the womb. And Abby had believed her whole entire career at Planned Parenthood that it was a clump of cells, babies didn't feel anything, um, and that she was helping women by performing all these abortions. So when they began this ultrasound-guided abortion, and the abortionist flipped on the machine, he said, beam me up, Scotty, and started to use this suction tool to suck the baby out of the uterus. And as she watched what was happening inside the mother's womb, she saw the baby move away from the instrument. The baby was kicking and moving and squirming to try to get away from the abortion instrument. She dropped the tool and left the room and never went back inside Planned Parenthood. She left the industry and she started an organization called And Then There Were None and she is very, very well known as an abortion activist, a, a, a pro-life activist. And um, she has become my friend. And she, they made a movie about her experience. It's called Unplanned. You should watch it. It's incredible. And she also started an organization called Loveline. And Loveline is an organization that they've asked me to help with. And we take crisis calls from clients all across the country. And these women call because they're in crisis for lots of different reasons. But lots of times it's because it has something to do with a pregnancy. And so our goal is to help them get through the crisis, to get on the other side of the crisis, choose life for their baby, or get out of the situation that they're in. There's lots of different reasons for crisis, but um, lots of times it has to do with a pregnancy. And because of what I do at Reliance, they wanted me to be an advocate, a client advocate, because it, you know, it fits in perfectly with what we're doing at the center. And Abby one day connected me with this woman from Renton. And she said, I know this is kind of close to you. And I was like, well, it's like five hours away. She said, but, but I think you'd be a good one for her. And I really, really um, want you to work with her. And I said, okay. So um, I call this girl and I say, hey, this is Heather from Loveline. You know, um, can you tell, what's going on? Tell me what's going on with your situation. And she started to tell me that she had had six abortions. And she was scheduled for her seventh. But she, did, she didn't know if she wanted to do it. So I said, okay, you know, what's going on? And she said, well, if I, if I choose life for this baby, then my boyfriend's going to leave and he's going to stop paying all the bills and he's going to take our dogs and I just don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to be a mom. I don't want to have another abortion. I don't want to do it, but I, don't, I can't do it financially. Her rent is like $1,800 a month, which I think is crazy. And I, Patrick and I have talked about this woman and he was like, that's kind of normal. And I was like, gosh, that's a lot of money for rent for a small apartment. So we have paid her rent, we have paid her electricity, we're going to pay all of her parking tickets off so that she can get her license back. She owes like three grand in parking tickets because she just hasn't gone to court and hasn't taken care of things because she was homeless for seven years. So um, Abby Johnson posted on her page a baby registry and in 56 minutes, 183 gifts were purchased for this woman. They were all shipped to Reliance Center, and Rick and I packed them all up in our car, and today we got to deliver all those gifts to this woman. And I had never met her until today. We've talked on the phone, and, and we've done these things. But um, today I got to listen to this brave woman tell me her story. We unloaded all the gifts into her house, and she was completely undone, and she sat in front of me in her living room and just started to cry, and she said, you are making my dream come true of being a mother. I deserve to be able to be a mom, and I said, you do. You are so brave. You are so brave for choosing life, and she said, I can do it right, and I said, you can absolutely do it. Absolutely, you can do it, and then we took her to lunch, and uh, we had lunch um, at this place in the landing in, in Renton, and um, we're at this Mexican restaurant, and she's sitting across from me, and I want you to know she gave me permission to share all of this. I want you to know that. And I said, tell me, tell me about your life. Tell me about, you know, what, tell me about you and, and what you've been through. And she's been homeless, and she had a really hard life, and she chose abortion for the first time 10 years ago because the doctor told her that there was something wrong with her baby. 
And she said when she was in the room, the doctor said, your baby has this diagnosis and we've scheduled for you to have a termination. Not, your baby has this diagnosis, do you want to talk about it? Or your baby has this diagnosis, diagnosis do you want to think about it? But your baby has this diagnosis, you're, we've scheduled you for a termination. And she just did it. That was her first abortion. Every year, every other year, for, five, for 10 years, this woman has had an abortion. And she sat across from us telling us about one of the late-term abortions that she had at 24 weeks. Because abortion is legal, up to 24 weeks in the state of Washington, I don't know if you know this, but a baby can survive outside of the womb at 24 weeks with medical technology. Did you know that? But abortion is still legal up until 24 weeks in the state of Washington. So she went to have the abortion. It's a three-day procedure. And the first day, they insert dilation rods so that they can start to dilate her cervix. It's very, very, very painful. The second day she goes back, they take those dilation rods out, insert new ones to dilate her even further. And they inject a drug into her belly that ends the life of her child. So on that second day, she has to go home knowing that she has her dead baby inside of her. The third day, she returns to the facility, and they remove the baby from her uterus. This girl sat across from us at lunch and said, I remember thinking that third day, why did I wait so long? Why did I wait so long? And she said, I waited so long because I didn't want to have an abortion. I'm sorry that I'm getting so emotional, but this is real. She said, I did not want to have an abortion. That's why I waited so long. And she said, but I felt like I had to. I felt like it was my only choice. Like I didn't have any other option. Do you know how angry that makes me? How angry that makes me with the society that we live in that this girl thought that she had no other choice but to take the life of her baby at 24 weeks. She's done that four times. The day that she contacted Abby Johnson, she was at the abortion clinic ready to have a 26-week abortion. And you know what she told us today at that restaurant? She said they knew that what they were doing was illegal, but they were going to do it anyway. And the injustice that's being done in our country because we're afraid. The injustice that's being done in our country because we're not trusting God makes me sick. But I want to walk you through the, pro the progression of my talks with her because when we can say to them, you, you got this, you can do this, we are for you, not against you. God is for you, not against you. This baby is not a surprise to God. You can be a great mom. God has put everything inside of you to be an incredible mom. When we can say those things, this is what happens. So she, she messaged me um, the night before the blue text. And, um, okay, oh, wait. Let's see. Okay, next. Next slide. I said, how are you feeling today? She said, I'm anxious and stressed. I had another appointment today at 10 a.m. for an abortion, and I didn't go. I'm doing what I want to make myself happy, but I can't feel that I'm being a little selfish since I have no money to care for my baby, and I'm just nervous. My response to her was, everything's going to be okay. We're going to help you. We, we already have arranged to pay your electricity. We already have arranged to, um, I'm sending you a gift, a gift card for some food, and I order you some groceries from Walmart. They're going to be delivered in a little bit. Because I'm sorry, but you are not pro-life if you think that buying groceries for a pregnant mom who's hungry is not part of the deal. Because it is. You are not pro-life if you think that buying groceries for a single mom who has no food for her kids is part of the deal, because it is. We have groceries on the way. Everything's going to be okay. She said, okay. The next day, she texted me and said, or a couple days later, rent is due. I'm stressed about that. I told him I was keeping the baby. He moved all his stuff out and took one of the dogs, so I'm really sad about that. I guess it's re reality is setting in of the choice I need to keep, made to keep my baby, and I'm scared for my future. And I said, you made the right choice. And then I went on to say, you, you can do this. It's going to be okay. I promise you, you are strong and you are brave. And you don't need him. You don't need him. Like, you can do it. You are strong. 
She said, thank you. It helps me to hear those things. I'm very nervous. I'm so thankful for your help. I'm thankful I met you. I'm, I deserve to keep my baby. What kind of a world do we live in when a woman has to say that? I deserve to keep my baby? That's something that they're saying in Cambodia when people are forcing them to have abortions, right? No, that's something that women are saying in the United States today. In Renton, Washington, she's saying, I deserve to be able to keep my baby. It's my dream to be a mother, and I was afraid if I got another abortion, I may not ever have the chance. I told her to make a registry on Amazon, and we would take care of it. She said, that will help take my mind off things. I've had such a difficult life. I just want peace and happiness. I sent her pictures of um, the baby registry stuff when it all got delivered to the center. The mailman came up, and he was like, Heather, I don't know what's going on, but I have a whole truck, and it's all yours, and you need to come help me. And so we carried all the stuff upstairs, and uh, actually, I made my assistant do it because I was on a conference call. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for conference calls, But because uh, we have, like, lots of stairs up to the center. But uh carried all this stuff up, and it filled this entire alcove of the center. There was a hundred and something packages. Like, it, the whole mail truck was full. It was all ours. So I sent her pictures, and her response was, I'm so thankful and grateful for your and Abby's help. I'm crying tears of joy. I'm going to call my doctor, schedule my next OB, OB appointment. Words cannot express how I feel right now. And I said, let me know if you need support. I can come over and help you. I kept telling her, she was like, you're so far away. And I was like, I will get in my car tonight and drive there. Like, I will. D I, and I told Rick several times, like, if I have to drive to Seattle, and he's just like, okay, like, let's go. <laughs> you know, he's on board. I told her I will come. She said, thank you. I'll keep you posted. And then she said, this was the la one of the last things that she said to me before we met. She said, it's my dream to be a mother for such a long time. I may not be in the best place of my life right now. I'm definitely struggling financially as in many other ways. But I'm so glad I didn't let those things stop me from keeping my son. I'm forever grateful for the help I've received. Thank you for making my dreams come true. I'll do everything in my power to give my son the best life I possibly can. Abortion doesn't empower women. Life empowers women. This woman has direction. She has peace. She feels the happiest she's ever felt in her 30 years of life. And it's because of what we're doing at Reliance Center. It's because of the choice to empower women through life. Meeting her today was incredible. We left, and I was told Rick, I said, how do you feel? And he's like, why so happy? And I said, I feel angry. I feel angry that we live in a place. And I told him, though, I said, I'm not going to stop till I'm dead. I will fight this fight until I'm dead. But you know what I want? I want people to know us for what we're for, not what we're against. So you know what we're against, right? But what we are for is saying yes to women. Yes, you can do it. Yes, it will be okay. Yes, you are strong. Yes, you are brave. Not no, you don't know the guy. No, you don't have enough money. No, you're too young. A 14-year-old? A girl who had oh, a mom who, or a pregnant woman who had had six abortions, the world would all say no to them, right? It's too late for you. You've already had six abortions. Just have another one. You're too young. You're 14. But we're about saying yes to women. If you go to the next slide, Cecil. Oh, the next slide. Pro life is a stance. But being pro-love is an action. It's a verb. And anyone can say that they're pro-life. And I know we're, we're coming up on an election. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to get political because that's not what we do. But I would just urge you to do your research, visit my faith votes, and vote for the pro-life candidates. We'll vote for the candidates that are going to uphold the sanctity of life. Because life empowers people, not death. Because if you were able to minister to these women, God's working through us. We're bringing hope back into families. We're saving marriages. We're breaking chains. We're stopping destructive cycles. We're showing people their worth and their value. And we're saving lives every day. Whether it's a saved baby or a woman who sees her worth and her value and stops making destructive decisions, we're saving lives. And we're doing it because of you. We couldn't do it without your help. 
So I'm so thankful that you invited us to come here again and for loving on us and making us feel seen and loved because that's what we all want, right? I heard at a conference we were at, um, everyone has their signs in their yards these days, right? And their signs have um, three words on them, right? Black lives matter, all lives matter, police lives matter, right? We kind of have to pick, like, well, what matters, you know? As Christians, our signs need to say, you are loved, not you matter. Because it doesn't matter if you matter. It matters if you're loved, right? And that's what we're doing at Reliance, is we're showing people that they're loved. So thank you.